So, Jean, um, first, actually, can you tell us a little bit about your background uh, in this work so that everybody has that sense? I probably should have even done a bio for you going into this, but, but let you uh, share a little bit about the background that you have in this work. Sure, thank you. So um, I've been involved in DEIB work or diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging um, almost since birth, it feels like. Um, having been <laughs> raised, uh, born and raised in a military family and living overseas um, at a time when, uh, you know, my parents who were from Texas and Louisiana would have gone to segregated schools. I had the benefit of going to um, Department of Defense schools and being in a multicultural setting um, and so that's where my passion for DEIB began. Um, and then when I left public schools in the early 90s and went to my first independent school, um, I really began to see um, the, 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 the connection between academic learning and the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, so I was at St. Mark's School of Texas for nine years. Uh, as a teacher and um, as a mid-level administrator of a, scholar, of a scholars program in, in diversity work. At that time, I was connected with NEIS through some committee work. I uh, presented at the People of Color Conference and um, I had an invitation in after spending a year in St. Louis as a um, assistant head and director of upper school, I went to NEIS for 13 years. Um, serving as vice president for um, professional development first and then for leadership development and equity and justice. While I was at NEIS um, and working at the national level on things like the People of Color Conference on developing uh, and implementing uh, an assessment of inclusivity and multiculturalism called AIM, I went back to school and got my doctorate at Penn um, and started my own consulting work. Um, and uh, actually started consulting with the school where I'm currently serving as chief diversity officer here in Houston, Texas. Um, and uh, that's what brought me to where we are. Uh, your, your background uh, is just uh, amazing. Um, and it's so helpful in helping us think through these challenging signs that we have right now. I, I'm wondering from where you sit, Gene, uh, what are some of the challenges that you've seen just emerge perhaps differently during this time of COVID-19 than you've seen previously? Yeah, and I made sure, thank you for the question, and I took a few notes, so I'm gonna to refer to my, my little cheat sheet here um, to get us <laughs> started. And I think um, the first thing that's coming to mind is the very impact of community um, has been um, um, thrown on its ear in, in the wake mm -hmm. of uh, COVID-19. Um, and the other thing I'm thinking about um, involves all the gains and the progress that schools have made uh, and diversity professionals and school leaders have made in uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging um, either are lost or they are putting, been put on the back burner. And, and that's for understandable reasons to some extent because we need to be about still being school and still focusing on teaching and learning in this, in this, new, in this, new, in this new way. Um, I think that as I hear from diversity professionals around the country through meetups, Google and um, Zoom meetups that I have weekly, um, some of them are feeling that they're not being consulted or involved in contingency planning, um, which is very ironic because these very diversity practitioners have been trained in crisis uh, and trauma management. And so mm -hmm. there's that sense of disconnection between um, the very um, um, expertise in how to be community um, from these individuals and not involving them or consulting them um, in this process. Um, I'm concerned also, and I'm hearing concern about this getting back to basics approach to teaching and learning um, in schools, particularly independent schools. And then finally, there's a stark impact of socioeconomic and class diversity that is very much apparent in this space uh, with virtual learning, particularly synchronous learning where um, teachers and students and other school, uh, other uh, adults in the community are seeing um, each other in their home space. And so we're seeing, um, you know, very obvious um, um, signs of um, uh, socioeconomic and class diversity in how backgrounds are presented. Some folks are actually camouflaging their real background with a, with a screen or something. Um, and so, um, that's a reality. I, and one of the one of the blogs I'm following, um, and a teacher is suggesting actually 
seeing a benefit of, of particularly when it comes to culturally responsive teaching, allowing her students to see her in her home space, but not just doing one static background, but actually doing her lessons from different parts of her home so that her mm. students can see her real lived experience. And then the final, mm. I think, um, challenge is, is assumptions. Just all of the assumptions that are coming to, to, um, to be challenges for our schools, assuming that you have Wi-Fi connection, assuming that um, you know, you're okay, um, and assuming that students can thrive when they're dealing with trauma and crises, and by extension, that adults are okay. And so I think that uh, school leaders and diversity professionals are really going to need to confront um, the assumptions that, that are, that are uh, coming to surface uh, because of COVID-19. There is so much to unpack there, Gene, and with That's only 30 funny. minutes, we're going to we're going to try to get through a, a whole bunch of those things. Um, again, folks, if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A button. Um, I'll continue to ask a couple of questions, but but want to make sure that we get to the questions that anybody has in here. Gene, can we follow up on on uh, a couple of things that you said in there? The first one uh, is that uh, you you're hearing from many DEIB practitioners that they're worried that it's taking a back seat or completely out of the vehicle kind of at this time. Yeah. What message does this convey about our school values and how might we be able to embed those values more fully into the way we respond to this crisis? Yeah, and so, uh, you know, what is that old, that old uh, adage, or maybe not so old, but that whole Maya Angelou line, when people show you who they really are, believe them. And so I think uh, diversity professionals and school leaders that are passionate about DEIB um, are wondering if the words that are uh, very impactful in our statements of community and inclusion or in DEIB are simply words. And um, so I think that now is the time um, where we take a look at those words um, and we try to engage in, with them again. Um, I think that um, this idea of extending grace and leniency is very important. Um, mm. We recognize as diversity professionals that schools need to run in this new, I don't know if we can call it a new reality, it's a present reality uh, for us. And so, um, you know, I think that diversity professionals need to be mindful that school leaders are trying to see how schools are going to survive. Um, you know, when it comes to tuition, I know that Jeff is doing a session next week on this. And so at the beginning, um, I, I, I've heard from some diversity professionals that they were uh, worried that they were not being consulted, that uh, DEIB was not just in the backseat, but not even in the vehicle anymore. And so um, I think that there's been some thought given to the fact that schools are trying to survive in this new space. And once a rhythm is, is in place for that, then we need to come back to looking at our statements, looking at our, our commitments and principles to DEIB and make sure that those are actionable um, and not just flowery speech. Uh, Shelly Cave uh, from the Hockaday School, another Texan, asks a uh, question here. Uh, are you finding concerns with kids in impacted socioeconomic homes taking care of little ones while parents need to work and those yeah. kids' difficulty in managing synchronous learning opportunities at schools? Right, particularly synchronous learning. Um, that, that I am hearing about that um, because you know parents, um, if they're either working in the home or if they're not, if they're essential. Uh, particularly, we're seeing that here in Houston with our medical um, with our medical staff, our med medical parents as well. Um, that is a concern. And again, grace and leniency really needs to be. Uh, in place here. Um, I know that a number of schools are modifying not just their expectations for learning, but also they're modifying their school schedules so that it's mm -hmm. not an eight to five or eight to three, um, but it's perhaps only a, a, a nine to one or rather than 45 minute you know, classes, they're doing 30. And they're providing an opportunity for modifications as needed given the home circumstance. And this is what the core of culturally responsive teaching is all about, where you set up a trusting relationship with your students, where you're mindful of their lived experience and what they're bringing to your virtual classroom um, and making adjustments as, as necessary. So uh, Annika asked a question, uh, any ideas about honoring transitions, traditions and farewells? Yeah. particularly in this space. 
Yeah, particularly uh, I'm, I'm, for those who, you know, whether it's, you know, graduating from kindergarten, going from middle to upper school or graduating high school, how you do that in a virtual space. Um, I'm hearing some very innovative um, uh, ways of doing this. Um, first, just honoring the, uh, the difficulty of honoring those rites of passage and those transitions, I think is key. Um, throughout all of this, um, my core message is communication and transparency are going to be so important. Um, and then finding novel ways. I, I heard one example a few weeks ago uh, in a Zoom conference that the Glasgow group um, sponsored of a school that is honoring their graduating seniors with graduation in a box. So <laughs> what they're doing mm. is that they're including their cap and gown and the diploma, a letter of congratulations from the head, um, some some uh, confetti or no uh, you know a noisemaker and putting it in a box and just shifting it to you know every every graduating senior um, just you know just as one example I think using Zoom and Google Hangout to have you know you know virtual celebrations while not the same as face to face um, can be a you know a short term kind of solution but I think it's also important to realize. We're simply postponing these important transitions. We may do them later rather than canceling them outright. So Gina, I also wanna follow up on something that you said earlier because it, it relates to uh, a topic that we've discussed in, in these webinars previously. And that is um, that schools should think really inclusively and uh, expansively mm -hmm. around the talents that they have in the building. So an example that we've thought about in this space before has been your athletic director is almost always somebody who is amazing at operations and can help you think through some of your operations on campus a little bit differently if you think about that expansive realm that they have. Uh, you talked about DEIB practitioners as having a really interesting, expansive um, uh, uh, set of competencies that we might not necessarily initially, uh, initially um, gravitate towards. Can you expand a little bit on that? Sure. I think that because DEIB um, professionals are working with classroom teachers on curriculum, they're working with uh, your division heads and with your associate head or your head of school when it comes to hiring and retention. They're asking those key questions about culturally responsive teaching, and they're asking those key questions and offering resources for cultural competency, which is going to be another very important thing to promote during this time of COVID-19. COVID and so um, I think just making sure that you include their voices, and it may not necessarily be in the answers they have, but the questions that they ask that can help um, in, in, in managing and thriving within this new reality. Jennifer asks, uh, do you have any suggestions for teachers or administrators on how to connect, reach, support students and families who aren't responsive? Um, or who are disengaging in this distance learning environment. I think yeah, particularly that, worried about students who are kind of falling through. Mm -hmm, right, and I, I'm reading and hearing a lot about that happening, uh, particularly in the public school sector. I haven't heard about it quite so much with independent schools, though that, that's not to say it's not happening. Um, and I would recommend that, uh, that we be proactive and that we consider every avenue, um, you know, including you know using email using text but if you need to like get in your car and do a drive-by you know and a little bit of a honk on your horn to say hi um you know that you know that distance kind of face-to-face -face kind of connection may be important i've heard from both uh my undergraduate school as well as a former school where i taught from their advancement office um uh, just reaching out to say um we don't want any money. <laughs> we just <laughs> we just want to connect to let you know that we're concerned about you. And so I think you know every avenue that you already use to communicate, uh, continue with those, but also consider um, a new way, including a drive-by. Um, and, and I'm using that word drive-by in a positive <laughs> way um, yeah. you know, to, to let to let those that are disengaging or are or, or reticent to engage uh, to, that you're still there. I, I've, I've heard of that too. I've heard of teachers going down and, and taking their kind of homeroom list and just doing drive-bys uh, around, uh, around neighborhoods and saying hi to kids uh, yeah. through their windows. Uh, Steve asked a great question about resources that you found particularly helpful to share with families to help them navigate this time at home. 
Yeah, um, a lot of great stuff, particularly when it comes to DEIB. I, I, I know that um, uh, NPR and public, public TV uh, are perhaps a lot of great sources. Scholastic um, is offering a lot of great resources as well. For those that are particularly concerned about uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging or social justice, um, Teaching Tolerance offers a lot of great resources that can be modified and used by families as well as by educators for, um, for keeping you know, that, that culturally responsive uh, space in mind. NEIS has um, extensive resources they make available on their website. Um, I would recommend that diversity practitioners and leaders seek out the Zoom and Google conferences that are available uh, because they too are curating resources. NAIS is doing it, the Glasgow group is doing it as well. Um, and I'm noticing that more and more state and regional associations are responding. My home region is ISAS, the Independent School Association of the Southwest. And we have a one o'clock um, Zoom meeting today for diversity professionals. And I think utilizing the expertise of others in the field through um, you know, virtual meetups is a, is a very present and very helpful resource that I've already implemented myself in the, in the weeks that you know, we've been dealing with this. It, it, is, it is wonderful to see, Gene, how, how the whole community is trying to come together and is starting to maybe figure that out. Is it, do we think that we're kind of, are, are we getting to the place where we're, where we're starting to figure it out? I, I hope so. I, I think that, you know, again, as schools are getting into a rhythm of the synchronous and asynchronous learning, um, you know, they are um, trying to rethink about community. And one tool that I would, well, I would recommend, um, you know, for diversity practitioners and school leaders um, is to use uh, something from organizational development um, called reconstructing questions. And I use this a lot in my consulting work. Um, and so take your, your statement on community and inclusion or take your principles around DEIB and ask four questions. What are we doing now that we can do more of to promote DEIB in our school, given this new reality? What are we, the second question, what are we doing now that we should do less of? Um, what are we doing, what, what aren't we doing that we should be doing is the third question to promote DEIB in this new reality. And then the final question would be, what are we doing that we need to stop doing um, in order to you know, not just maintain, but thrive in community and inclusion in DEIB with this new space. Um, and I have never had um, negative impact or I've, I've, I've always had, let me, let me say this in a appreciative inquiry way. Using these four reconstructing questions have, have served me and served the schools I serve very well in reimagining and rethinking um, a number of important things, including your DEIB work. You know, that, that's a nice transition into the question that Tressa asks here about what we need to be thinking about as DEIB professionals going into the fall of 2020. I know that a lot of schools that I've been working with, Gene, have started to shift from, okay, we can get through this year mm -hmm. to what the heck is the fall going to look like? That, right. that shift in conversation seems to be happening right now. So exactly. I'm glad that Tressa asked that question. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I think one thing is um, to think now about the new ways that diversity professionals and school leaders that are passionate about DEIB will, um, will do their own professional development this summer. Um, I, I'm seeing that a number of um, organizations and institutions are moving to virtual PD for DEIB. Seek those out and, and continue with your own um, um, development in this area. Um, I know that in my own case, uh, we, have, uh, we have community and inclusion associates uh, at St. John's and we're gonna have a spring retreat and, and virtually. Uh, and, and part of that is going to be to start our planning for 2021. Um, those faculty forums and those other ways we're going to involve our faculty associates um, in, in, in doing professional development. Start working on your calendar now, realizing that you want some flexibility to it. And so that's the other thing that, that I recommend. You know, make sure that your PD is in place and make sure that you're thinking strategically now about plans. 
Um, do this in a co-creative way. Uh, this is an opportunity mm -hmm. in a virtual space to involve school leaders, to involve students, and to involve parents in, in reimagining um, DEIB work and how to deliver it. And that's what, what a way to get buy-in from your community if you say, we really want to rethink what we are going to do in DEIB. Come join us and be part of this effort. That's great. Um, final question that we have in here, and folks, again, continue to put your questions that you have into the Q&A area. Uh, this is a person who's been attending the NAS Diversity Practitioners Discussion, and it was asked that NAS speak to heads about having DEIB DEIB at the table. Right. Uh, they're wondering, Gene, if you know the status of that. I do not know the status of that. Um, I was part of that, that uh, NEIS Zoom meeting as well. And I, I even believe I was the one who spoke with um, the Vice President for Equity and Justice you know, about that importance. Um, by extension, I, I know that state and regional associations know to have, you know, to involve heads in that way as well. Um, but I do not know specifically the status from hearing from NEIS, um, you know, to our heads of school about making sure that DEIB remains front and center. Gene, any, we don't have any additional questions right now. So I'm just going to open up the floor and ask you if there are any other things that we should really be thinking about as academic leaders in our schools. Um, particularly, I guess, focused towards not just completing of the school year, but understanding that we may be in a very different environment heading into this fall. Sure. I mean, let me go back to my cheat sheet to make sure that I've, in, I've included everything. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that teaching and learning and even being, simply being a school during crisis and during trauma is, is um, very, very important. Um, we haven't talked about social emotional learning, but there is a strong link between um, striving to be a school and the impact of social emotional learning um, for yep. students um, and making sure that you have SEL um, plans in place, not only to finish out this year, but for next year um, as well. And um, adults in the school community need as much grace and leniency <laughs> during this time as we are affording, um, uh, affording students. Um, and uh, use this time to collaborate with other schools. Um, you know, use NEIS, use Glasgow Group, um, reach out to, to others that you know of and share your uh, ideas and share your, uh, your struggles with DEIB and COVID-19. Um, and, and that's the one we were gonna, when we were gonna get through this is that we begin to collaborate and we see a, a level of interdependence in in um in moving in moving forward i think that's that's basically it i'm, I'm always available to uh, answer questions beyond this um not necessarily always have the answer but i could ask more questions or try to make a connection um, um as well and i'm just so grateful that one schoolhouse is um is realizing the importance of this conversation for school leaders well, Gene, we all appreciate the expertise that you bring to this conversation um, and, and, and the care and thoughtfulness that you bring to everything that you do. So thank you so much, Gene, for joining today and for offering your, your guidance for academic leaders. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Brad.